Hey guys, Adam Trigger here, wagertalk.com. With me, Kai McKeon from Three Man Weave. We're here to break down the A10, but first, for our Wager Talk viewers that might not know who Kai and the Three Man Weave are, Kai, introduce yourself and, and tell us what you've got going on at Three Man Weave and at Circa in March Madness this year. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Thanks for having us, or for having me, rather, but you're having the weave in general. Uh, yeah, Three Man Weave, uh, Twitter handle, 3MW underscore CBB. We do best bet shows on a daily basis. Uh, this week, 9 a.m. Central. You can check it out on our YouTube channel, Three Man Weave, or hit the link at our Twitter, 3MW underscore CBB. Got one Saturday as well for some conference tournament action. Uh, Going to do a little bit of a selection Sunday show with the field of 68. And then uh, during the tournament itself, Elite Eight, Sweet 16 weekend, We'll be live from Circus Sports, from Stadium Swim, uh, doing some shows uh, for that round of basketball. Going to be great. Circus Sports, one of the best um, sports books out there. I'd say the best sports book out there, actually, Adam. Uh, but yeah, check us out. Yeah, I would agree with that. Circuit took care of the Wager Talk crew this past summer when we were out for an event. It's a phenomenal place. And if you're a sports better, it is the place, um, the, the mecca, if you will, uh, for, for sports betters, the way it's set up and the way they cater to sports betting. So confession here, Kai and I tried to do this a day ago. The volume did not work. So we are joining in a little bit, you know, in the middle of the tournament, but I think it's going to make for a better preview for you guys because we are going to just go right to the Wednesday games and really talk Wednesday through Saturday through the bracket. So let's go to Wednesday morning, Kai. 8-9 game, George Mason, St. Joe's. Just right off the top, the way I feel about this game, I feel like this is going to set the tone for a great day of hoops on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. These two teams seem very, very close in, in terms of, you know, you look back to the regular season matchup, um, you know, St. Joe's stole it by two. It was a great game. Uh, you know, the, the, the metrics are, are very even, but the thing that could be an issue here is we don't know the status of Keyshawn Hall. Now, Kai, do you know is Keyshawn Hall out? And, and if so, can, can George Mason advance without him? No, I forgot what his what his deal was. If it was injury suspension, I I, I do not know. Uh, but yeah, he is key for them. Uh, it, yeah, George Mason. Hey, credit to Tony Skin. What a season he, he's had taking over first year. Um, they're a really solid team. They, they grind it out. No flash to them. Rebound, rim attack, free throw line, decent defense. I really like St. Joe's though here, especially in a tournament setting. I took them for a little bit uh, at twenty five to one to win the A ten. They're a good flyer. We've seen them play up to competition before with Kentucky this season. They beat Villanova. They just have an awesome backcourt. It, it, it's electric. Um, Joe's did win the only matchup here this season. It was a close game. And the the, the glass is certainly a, a concern for St. Joe's against George Mason. But George Mason doesn't defend the three well. And I think that's where St. Joe's is especially dangerous. I really like this backcourt. Um, I, I think they can win this game. And if everything breaks right, win the tournament. Yeah, and, you know, as far as Hall's status, he, he hasn't played since the Fordham game. He's definitely important. Ken Palm has him as one of the, the sort of highest usage players in this conference. Um, so, you know, again, and, and they don't always tell you, right? Like, so the other thing to, mm. to note is, like, you know, if he comes back and tries to play and he's not 100%, we've seen that a lot in conference tournaments where, like, guys have come back, the line has moved, and then, it you know, it, they're not the full version of themselves. Selves, but, like, you know, as far as George Mason is concerned, I guess to, to you know, kind of wrap it up, like they, they've kind of been hot and cold, but when they are not shooting well, it's not pretty. They had a little bit of a, a, a lull a, a couple weeks ago, three-game losing streak where they really did not shoot the ball well, scoring in like the low 50s and the 60s, and they are turnover prone. So I definitely agree with you, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the next round. The, the, the team with the bigger upside of these two, without a doubt, is St. Joe's. There's no question about that. The way they play, they, they're more efficient on offense. And I think they're the type of team, if they can get through this one, they've got a great chance to beat Richmond in the next round, which we'll get to in a second. But we'll head to the next matchup. It's going to be VCU playing the winner of Fordham and Davidson. Kai, you know, we'll, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll talk about this matchup kind of quickly because I want to spend more time on the VCU UMass game. I think UMass, or I think UMass is a bad matchup for VCU, but that's the next round. First, VCU's got to get through the winner of Davidson Fordham. Um, you know, VCU kind of got really, really hot at one point, you know, where they were just wiping teams out. I think they held uh, Dayton to like uh, 47 points. Teams yeah. were going like three of 18, four of 20, could not buy a three from them. Some of that was their great defense, but some of that might be, it might have been a little bit of luck because if you go back to the early part of the mm -hmm. season, there was a stretch where they were giving up 80, 90 points and getting torched on their home floor, something we don't typically see from VCU. 
a little bit of a transition year for them. What VCU showing up in Brooklyn? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I do like Ryan Odom, their, their coach. Um, I, I like that they have good guard play. They have a really good offense, a great shooting team, a great free throw shooting team. Both those things, I think, translate in, in tournament settings. The defense, I, I kind of agree that the stretch that they had was a bit fortunate. Um, they're decent enough on that end. They do protect the glass, which is huge. So if Fordham gets past Davidson, I think VCU is a pretty strong matchup there. I think they get past Davidson as well. But the, the, the fact that they take away the glass is especially key against a Fordham Rams team. So I expect VCU to advance. As far as them versus UMass, that's more of a toss-up in my mind. Yeah, I do expect them to get through the first day there. More more so, uh, I just don't know that Fordham or, or, or Davidson can can really challenge them. It's more It would be more of a fate of, of those two teams that I just don't think are very good. Um, now, this is an interesting one because – you know, St. Saint Bonaventure is the seventh seed. And I think you and I would both agree that we did not think that this team would, would finish this low coming into the season. Uh, yeah. um, you know, they're a somewhat local team to me here in, in central New York. They're kind of our Atlantic 10 team, if you will. Um, you know, I follow, follow them closely for that reason. And, uh, you know, I, I thought this team was kind of destined maybe for like a, a top four, top five finish. So seeing them down mm-hmm. there at seven instantly – makes me do what I kind of do in these conference tournaments. I go back to my preseason rankings and say, okay, where was I wrong? And like, who can I buy low on to like ride in this tournament? So that team for me would be the Bonnies, but they are very mm-hmm. Jekyll and Hyde, right? Like sometimes this team comes out and they're phenomenal. Sometimes they come out and lose to LaSalle or to George Washington, who they mm-hmm. would be playing in this game. They're not a good rebounding team, which is an issue, um, but they've got some real playmakers at the guard position. So I don't know, Kai, what, what Bonnie's team do we get here? And is there any value on them in the, in the futures market at like 13 or 14 to one? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I do think in general, a good strategy for these conference tournament games is take your preseason expectations and kind of carry that forward. Now it doesn't work hundred percent of the time, but I think a lot of times you'll see teams that maybe underperformed in conference regular season, sort of realize their potential, get back on track in these tournament settings obviously do or die environments um, sort of kind of a reset on the season, so to speak. Yeah. The bodies were the most disappointing team in the a 10. It, it's crazy to me that they're seventh. Now they're still a top 100 Kim Palm team. This is still a really good team. They still arguably have the best coach in the league in Mark Schmidt. They're the most experienced team in the country. They're super old. They've played together for a while. A lot of these guys and they can shoot and they can score. It's just a lot of, a lot to like in my opinion in a tournament setting I think they're a pretty solid bet. If you can find 15 to one, I wouldn't mind taking a flyer on them. Can they get past the actual flyers? Dayton is a real question. Um, True. We watched that game live, obviously at Dayton between the Bonnies and and Dayton. Um, It it is a problem. Also, in my opinion that St. Bonaventure doesn't really run. They don't play in transition. I think that's a huge mistake considering how much talent they have. So it's a bit dicey when backing them. Um, But I trust the coach. I trust the offense. I trust the experience. Yeah, it's interesting you said, you know, to make a comment about the way they they sort of, you know, don't play in transition because the the, the game we were at, St. Bonaventure Day, uh, Dayton, that's how they got back in that game. They started mm-hmm. to stay, but but instead of sort of going to the rim in transition, they would kind of fan out for an open three. I think they hit like three or four transition threes that that pretty much got them right back into the game. Had a had a lead in the second half for a stretch. So, yeah, it would it would be nice to to see them do that more. Because really, like, I mean, you take away, like, the rebounding is is poor. 291st nationally yeah. in total rebounding coming into the tournament. That can be an issue. But but not all of these A-10 teams can really exploit you on the glass. So, and, and certainly not a team like LaSalle or, or George Washington is not going to just crush you on the board. So hmm. uh, neither is Loyola Chicago, really, who, who they would potentially get in the next round. So uh, I think the Bonnies are very interesting. They're definitely one of the, the teams that I would say seven or lower – I think if you're, I think outside of St. Bonaventure, St. Joseph's, I don't see any of these other lower seeds really making a run. I personally don't see anyone playing Tuesday winning more than, you know, maybe someone upsets someone on Wednesday, but then they're probably yeah. a double digit dog on Thursday and, and take it on the chin. But the Bonnies have a chance here. Right? And, and I think they will probably get by the team that they draw in this first round meeting. Yep. I, I definitely uh, agree. You, yep. So Kai, you made a comment here. Preseason sort of ratings. I got to admit, I got one wrong with this Duquesne team. I I went on Wager mm-hmm. Talk programming. I said this is the team that I think could could win this league, kind of be an outside shot to win this league. I believe I even said they're my pick to win this league, and that was very much wrong. 
And, and, and this is a scenario where I'm not going back to my preseason rating because I really just, I'm just not, this, this Duquesne team's not it for me. They take really bad shots. They do defend. So mm-hmm. we'll give credit where credit is due. Third uh, in defensive efficiency in this conference. But something as I go through these conference previews, I've done a few of them now. I find myself gravitating toward the offensive efficient teams from from the context of team that I think could actually win three games in three days. It is mm-hmm. really, really hard, especially the way college basketball is set up now, to just grind it out on defense for four, you know, this would be four days in a row for Duquesne. So I don't think Duquesne can win this tournament. I do think they could present a matchup issue, potentially even for Dayton in the next round. But I mean, are they are they completely immune to losing to a Rhode Island or a St. Louis? I would say probably not. How are you seeing the Dukes, you know, playing out in the sixth seed here? Yeah, another disappointing team overall. Started 0-5 in the league, which was shocking from where well, I agree with you. I had, t- I had them in the top four of the A-10 preseason. They finished 10-3 and over the final 13 games, so they are playing better. It is driven by defense, lockdown defense. They force turnovers. Importantly, they defend the arc really, really well. They, de- they defend the three-point line. I really like teams that do that in conference tournaments. They can't score, though. And, and that's obviously a huge problem. I think you need to be at least decent uh, on both ends, especially the offensive end, to win a conference tournament. Of course, it helps being dominant defensively, but Duquesne is is good defensively. They're not dominant, I, I would say. They have great guards. They have Jimmy Clark and Day-Day Grant. Unfortunately, like you said, they take bad shots. It is the second worst offense team, offensive team in the league from an efficiency perspective. I do, I do think they're well coached. However, I think I, I think Dayton pops them. I think they have a real shot to lose to either Slew or Rhode Island as well. I just don't really believe in them uh, to make a long run. A ton of time on, on Tuesday games here because of when this is getting posted. But let's just assume Slew gets Sincere Parker back and then they get through. Rhode Island. That's a super off, uh, efficient offensive slew team that's been yeah. really poor defensively. That might be like the perfect scenario for for St. Louis because they've kind of shown the ability to score right with anyone in this conference. If you look at their offensive metrics, they they stack up very good. And again, I just think Duquesne lets teams off the hook. And and the other thing I've noticed with Duquesne is the shot selection when they start to trail gets worse. Right? Like you know, there's a couple times yeah. I was on them. <laughs> Uh, I backed them against Loyola Chicago earlier this year. They had an 11 point lead in the first half, went to the second half, found themselves down nine. And suddenly it was, it was Clark. It was Grant just like bombing from, from 30. And it's like, you've got eight minutes to get back into this game. I've seen that happen on a couple of other instances this year where I want to say it was maybe Dayton a couple weeks ago, where Mm -hmm. it was like a close game and they ended up losing the game by like 20 because it really goes out the window when they trail. That's just not the profile of a team that I want any part of in a conference tournament do or die setting. Um, so, so I'm kind of out on the Dukes, but let's like go, let's go back up the bracket now. So we'll take Duquesne. Let's just assume Duquesne gets through slew. It's not the worst matchup in the world against Dayton because they do defend the perimeter, but man, this Dayton team just seems like the most complete team in this tournament. They, I think they're kind of far and away the best team in this field. Talk to me about Dayton, Kai. Is this your pick to win the A-10 tournament this year? Yeah, it is. I would say easily the best team in the in the A-10. Uh, I, I expect them to win. Most importantly, getting Javon Bennett back is huge. He's supposed to play in the A-10 tourney. They would be screwed without him. They're, they're not a deep team. They don't need to be with their style of play, but he's their point guard. He, he transferred in from Merrimack. He's been fantastic this season, taking over from Malachi Smith, who's out for the year. Uh, obviously, they have Drawn Holmes, an All-American. They have a rock-solid backcourt around Bennett. And Santos is a really, really underrated piece in the front court as well. Again, I don't think you need a deep bench in a tournament setting, even though it is three days, th- three games, three days, whatever it is. I just don't think you need it. I think Dayton wins this tournament. Uh, best team, in my opinion, by, by a good margin. Kai, I agree with you. As you can see, I got my Dayton Flyers hoodie yeah, on that we grabbed <laughs> when we were at. This is the... Powder blue Dayton Flyers uh, gear that they were on Friday nights. We were in Dayton on a Friday night. It was phenomenal. Awesome atmosphere. Don't think they lost a home game this year. But I will point out that their four losses, they were all on the road. And they were all to teams that are top seven or better in defensive efficiency in this conference. So Richmond, VCU, Loyola Chicago, and George Mason. I think the reason that is important is because if they run into a team that really like kind of struggles to defend, you either have, like with Dayton, you've got to worry about Deron Holmes, who's the best player in this league. 
and the fact that they're a top five three pointing three point shooting team nationally. That is going to be super hard to go up against in a tournament, and then you start to you know, factor tired legs into it. I'm kind of with you. I, I would be really, really surprised if, if anyone has the ability to to get over the hump against Dayton. Now, could Duquesne maybe cover the number because they're they can defend the three and hang around? I suppose so. But I'm with you. I I I think Duke, Dayton is. Like I wouldn't be taking a shot with a Richmond or, or like someone in that four to five to six to seven to one range. I just don't think there's enough value there. Like uh, if you want to sprinkle with like a total long shot, that's fine. But this Dayton team's just too good in my opinion. Agreed. Um, we will continue up the the bracket here. So let's go back to what would be the potential two seven game if the Bonnies do advance and get past LaSalle or GW. They get Loyola Chicago. Kai, I know you're you know, in, in Loyola, Chicago country, it's in your backyard. Uh, I got to be honest, was totally wrong about this team as well. I, I was, I thought they might be better than last year because they, I thought they got very unlucky last year. But when you look at some of the metrics, they still turn the ball over a ton. They, they they play like a team that should be like a 500 team in this league. I can't believe they finished where they did. Do you think they regress in the tournament or is this team just, do they just find ways to win? I can't figure them out. Yeah, I, I expect them to be a lot better this year as well. However, they exceeded my expectations and, and then some. It's another defensive team, the best in the A-10. They locked down the interior, and, and that's really, I think, predictable or at least um, translatable game to game, whereas three-point shooting defense can be a bit uh, variant, hit or miss. I think two-point percentage defense is predictable. 44% allowed from two is absolutely nuts. Uh, Adela Kuhn and Ruben, their two big guys, have been fantastic. They're just kind of solid everywhere else. They they have solid wings. They have solid guards. They do have some perimeter size. There's no real flash. They do move the ball well. They they work it for shots. They don't have the best offense, though. They, they do play with a chip on their shoulder. I think that's kind of been their secret all season. They do not give up. I think Valentine is a solid coach as well, and they've just found ways to win games, found ways to come back, win close games, complete opposite of the previous season. However, I'm not sure they have the firepower to win the A-10. I wouldn't even be surprised if Bonaventure got them in, in, in the, the Tuesday round. I'm just not really high on their prospects, I suppose. Kai, what, what's crazy about the fact that they've won so many close games is they are, they turn the ball over a ton, and they're 304th nationally in uh, shooting just 68.4% from the free throw line as a team. The two literal things that typically cost teams close games. They don't do well at all. And yet they've won so many close games. So it's like that to me, I feel like I've, I've been playing this out. Like it's got to reverse at some point, but Kai we're in March and and it just hasn't yet. So maybe they're, maybe they're getting all of their plus regression that was due to them from like having such horrible negative variants last year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't figure it out. Just something tells me that they're too defensive reliant to win three games in three days. But, hey, they've been proving me wrong all season. All right, let's continue to move up the bracket. Um, This is the matchup, VCU-UMass. I think this is a terrible matchup for VCU. I think UMass sort of, you know, figured them out in the – as I apologize for my dogs barking. They're going nuts (laughs) right now. They – you know, it's March. The dogs bark. That's what they do. Um, (laughs) But, Kai, I'm going to mute myself and let you take VCU-UMass because I just think it's a bad matchup for VCU. UMass attacks the rim as well as anyone in this conference. UMass, second in offensive efficiency in this league. I bet a lot of people don't have that off the top of their head. Um, Does Frank Martin get to the semis with a win here? Yeah, they had no issue with VCU in their only regular season game. It was impressive. They are a good offensive team. They're the best offensive rebounding team in the conference. That's translatable from game to game. Really, Josh Cohen coming in from from Sacred Heart was the difference maker here. He's translated, excuse me, it might have been St. Francis. I actually forget which which uh, which red team it was from the NEC. But regardless, he's turned into an all-A-10 player, which is astounding, frankly. Sometimes you don't know how these guys will translate. He has translated and then some. He rocks. Matt Cross has elevated his game. Outside of Jerron Holmes with Dayton, he might be the most important single player to his team in the conference. And then Diggins. Diggins has really lived up to his pedigree. He was a big high school recruit, went to UConn out of high school, and he's finally starting to live up to that pedigree. He's playing really good basketball. Like a lot of other teams in this league, very well coached. The one thing about them, though, they're very young. Outside of those top three, a ton of underclassmen. I'm not sure I totally trust 
to go very far. Uh, but against VCU, I think, again, I think it's a toss up. They've proven they kind of dominated them before. And they're certainly arguably better on both ends of the floor than VCU this season. Yeah, the interesting thing there that I that I kind of had some time to think about since we kind of like first spoke about this game is the fact that VCU is going to get like now a second crack at them. So you you, you mentioned they only played one time during the regular season, uh, but UMass really cannot shoot the three whatsoever. They are are fifteenth out of fifteen teams in the A10 in conference, only three point percentage. Um, they can't shoot the three, and my only I guess my only concern with UMass here would be if Odom, a very good coach, uh, yep. can make the adjustment and sort of and sort of force them out to the perimeter. Because if they can because they got just destroyed at the rim in that first meeting. If they can, that's where they could lose it. That, that's where they could lose this game because that is not a good uh shooting team. If UMass starts bombing from three, they're probably losing the game. And that's and that's kind of I I think, you know, I guess would be my main concern with them, you know, in a three three win, three days type setting. Do they, you know, at some point, because they have been been prone to it, falling in love with the outside shot, even though they're not very good at it, that'll get them a quick quick exit from this tournament, in my opinion. All right, Kai, we go back up to Thursday, the final matchup for Thursday. Back at the top of the bracket, I believe it's the first one that will go. It's Richmond against the winner of the 8-9 game. You like St. Joe's to make some noise in this tournament. I think the winner of this game can give Richmond a hard time. Uh, you know, Richmond is... Uh, I. I think Dayton's the best team in this league. If you look at some of like Richmond's predictive metrics, they're they're lower and specifically on offense. Adjusted offensive uh, adjusted offensive efficiency is down, you know, 148. There's a there's probably five or six teams in this league that are that are better than them there. They do defend, but I don't know. This feels like a, a team that's gotten a little lucky this year as well. Can the eight or nine winner clip them in this one eight matchup? Yeah, there's, there's eight teams better in the offensive efficiency in the A10 right now, which is which is crazy, really, because Richmond historically has been an offensive program under Chris Mooney. This year, it's defense, top thirty in the country right now. Credit to Chris Mooney. Um, I was frankly shocked they won this league. The schedule helped a little bit. They played Dayton once at home. They played St. Bonaventure once at home. They did lose to UMass at, at home, who they played only once, and they did win at Loyola. So there's partial credit here for Richmond. There's partial some schedule luck, uh, partial some other stuff, but they don't make mistakes to their credit. Despite their offense efficiency, they do not turn the ball over. Their offense is surgical. It's Princeton-esque. Uh, Jordan King has turned into a literal star, a, tr- a transfer from Siena. Neil Quinn is among the best pa- uh, passing bigs in the country. It's a very good backcourt. I do like Chris Mooney as a coach. He was in the hot seat, so funny, for like five straight years, and now he, he finally won the A-10, so... Be careful what you wish for, Richmond fans. But I do think uh, either George Mason, who beat them by 18 this season just recently, or St. Joe's, a team that can, I think, can beat literally anybody in the country, can pull the upset here. And I sort of expect them to and, and get past the Spiders. Yeah, so before we, we talk about like the top four kind of like teams collectively, we'll, we'll kind of go into who we think we can win this thing. Uh, I'm with you on St. Joe's for the, for the money, for the price. Right. I kind of mentioned yep. that. Yeah. I didn't love the the middle tier sort of value because, because I think Dayton is so good, but the, the appeal to St. Joe's one, you know, you're getting, you know, close to, let's call it over 20 to one. And you can get on in on this live at any point in the tournament. Like, you know, anytime before they tip off, like the Tuesday games are really not going to make a difference. They're still going to be in like the 21 or 20 to one range to win this thing. I like that they're on the opposite side of the bracket of, of Dayton. So that's, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they were competitive with Richmond in a loss during the regular season. Uh, so maybe they can make some adjustments there and, and you know, potentially, you know, come up with a win in that game. Uh, but again, they kind of fit the profile. Uh, they're like fourth or fifth in basically every, you know, sort of relevant offensive category against the rest of the A-10. And I guess, you know, when it, when it comes to a tournament like this, I'll take that over. Yeah. Are, do they have a hard time, you know? rebounding the ball. They're going to give up some offensive rebounds. They're going to give up some threes. All of that's, you know, you take into consideration, but I think the upside with these longer shots in these types of tournaments comes with a team that can score the ball and St. Joe's can, those guards can do it as good as anyone in this conference really. So I'm with you there. Yeah. And you, and you saw St. Joe's go far last tournament too. I think great guards win in March. There's countless examples of that. And St. Joe's has great guards. 
without a doubt. So we we're now to kind of conclusion time. Um, you know, we, we won't go into the semis or the finals, but you know, it, it is, I I'm with you here. Like, I think Dayton, it's going to be really hard to knock Dayton off. You know, they, they had, you, you got to think back to the COVID year, right? Like they were going to be a one seed probably, right? They probably would have yep. rolled through this tournament. I don't even think this tournament really got underway, you know, before that got called no. off. Um, and, and I don't think they've won it since I, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can't remember the last time the Flyers won this tournament it's been a little while so they're going to be motivated here and i think if you get a motivated team a motivated dayton team that shows up in brooklyn i don't know if any of these other teams can beat them um yeah they, they've that, never won it under you know yeah anthony grant has never yeah, won ahead. the a10 tournament yeah so they haven't won it under grant which is seven years they made the, t- the the tournament with archie miller four straight before that um i i'm not sure i they probably won the tournament one of those years but yeah it's been a while uh, I'm sure Anthony Grant is well aware of that. His players are aware of it. I do think they win this tournament. Uh, now, plus 150 is what it is out there in the market. It's not a horrible price. Um, you know, I, I might prefer to just take a flyer in this one instead. I, I do like the fact they're on the opposite side of Richmond. Uh, and and St. Joe's a team, again, I like a lot. Uh, but I, I do expect them to win the tournament. Kyle, I'll hit you with a, a kind of a question. I don't expect you to know this off the top of your head. If you do, that's awesome because we have to address this the a10 plays an unbalanced schedule of course like it, it yep. really does matter like who you play twice do you know who had the strongest conference strength of schedule in the a10 it was slew it was slew it was yeah. and so you know you want to talk about if you want to go way, way off the board go way off the board with a team that's going to be an obnoxious price that's going to play on tuesday or, or maybe some you know gets through their mm-hmm. tuesday game slew would have if they can get through rhode island i think duquesne is very vulnerable and they can score. They play the toughest schedule in the A10 and, and for a long stretch of it without their best player, best couple players, I think. So who knows? Yes. Maybe Slew's worth a little sprinkle. I know it's not like the best sort of scenario there right now, but I don't know. I think you could do worse. Hey, they could get lucky. Their defense has been terrible this season, but we've seen teams already this season across tons of conference tournaments get lucky with three point luck. That's how you make runs in, in, in a conference tournament. And we know Slew can score. So I, it's possible. I'll say it's possible. Yeah, SLU adjusted offensive efficiency, 89th nationally. Um, yeah. That's better than a lot of this conference. So mm-hmm. who knows? Maybe the Billikens out there, bottom corner, make a little run and, and at least get to a, a potential quarterfinal showdown with Dayton. Um, but yeah, they are are quite, that would be quite the long shot in this tournament if it, if it was to happen. All right, Kai, that's our A10 preview. I think we're kind of in agreement here. We both like, Dayton quite a bit to cut the nets down in Brooklyn. We gave you a couple long shots to maybe get involved with. Kai, tell the people again where they can find you. Talk to talk about your event at Circa, and we'll close this thing down. Yep, Three Man Weave is on Twitter at 3MW underscore CBB. Uh, daily best bet show on our YouTube channel, Three Man Weave. And then we will be at Circa Sports at Stadium Swim doing live shows during the Elite Eight and the Sweet 16 uh, later this month. Yeah, guys, make sure you give a follow to them at three man weave uh we'll put the twitter in the in the we'll put it in the tweet and um their best bet shows are second to none I, if you're looking for info about some of these smaller teams which you should be coming ncaa tournament time when that's really the name of the game uh you got to be watching three man weave they have more info than anyone else really in my opinion out there that's that's doing these shows so uh give them a follow like and subscribe to our channel here at wager talk on, on the wager talk youtube channel Follow me on Twitter at TopLightSI. We'll continue previews throughout Championship Week. Um, Take care.